He's on a roll and I need to grab a plug and we're, we're having some technology issues. Keep talking, Joe. I'm going to grab a plug. I'll be right back. Okay. So the, of course there are electives too. I'd love for my kids to do some economics in high school. I'd love for them to do some art um, and love for them to be doing some sports as well. But those to me are the main, you know, 12 or 16 or how many courses that they, those are the subjects they really, you know, need to learn. And I don't know what's going on over there, but it's not this good. Is such a mess. <laughs> this office is not super organized. People are gonna think you plan this stuff. I mean, it's just cra it's crazy. Like, okay, it's just crazy. Okay, so anyway. Um, okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> she's always like this. I mean, it's not it's not an act. It is Jen Fulweiler, stand-up comic and mom of six, here by request to talk about the details of our Joe schooling philosophy. I have named that here after my husband, Joe. He has some really different ideas about education that have impacted how we impact our kids. This is a whole series. You can go back and look up the series here on my channel. Don't forget to subscribe and like so that you will have, you'll, YouTube will show you the new videos when they come out. Just to review, I went into this in the first video, but I want to give you a little background on my husband. There's a whole video you can look up on that, but it will help you understand how he came to some of these ideas. He grew up poor, was raised by a single mother, ended up going to Yale for college, graduating in three years with honors, and going to Columbia Law, Stanford Business School, and studied in the master's computer science program while he was at Stanford. So that he has, he has an interesting educational background. And again, you can look up the other videos where we go into that. So today, today's the big day where we are going to detail and make it as simple as possible what we have done for our own children's education. And the, the idea here is not that everyone is going to adopt our principles exactly to the T, but I think that you will be able to find elements of what we have done that might work for you. So Joe, uh, we, so we have, we have always homeschooled our six kids, pretty much. <laughs> Except for that one failed experiment in kindergarten <laughs> with our oldest at a charter was, school. We, yeah, he, he made it about what, three months. I, I, I'll never forget. It was a Tuesday <laughs> in November where a series of events, um, Involving Yaya even. That's right. We talked about his mother, Yaya, who was the mm -hmm. one who instilled this education ethic in him. She's mm -hmm. a, we, we talked in other videos about how she is a mission driven person. Mm -hmm. uh, she is also a real warrior for justice. And if she sees things that are amiss, she might I'd start yelling at principals. Just theoretically, that could happen. She had to yell to get to the principal, if you remember. Like, yeah, well, yell, <laughs> yell the all the yeah. way up yes. to the principal. Yes. Long story short, it could end up with me getting a phone call on a Tuesday in November that we are now a homeschooling family. No, uh, we, we made was, the choice. Uh, I mean, okay. it was coming maybe, but we made the choice. Okay. <laughs> so, but that was kindergarten. That was our oldest child, who is now 15 years old. So, and, and again, we have six kids. So that it's, ever since then, we have homeschooled, except the oldest two, they wanted to go to private school, so now they go to private school. So let me begin by sharing the background of how we developed this Joe schooling <laughs> system, because I think it will, it will help you understand some of the details. So when we started homeschooling, I got very deep in homeschooling mom culture. And we are Catholic, so I got I got very deep in the Christian homeschooling mom culture. And within that culture, there is one typical system that people use that seems to work very well for a lot of these families. Um, didn't work as well for me. And it's very much parent as teacher model. It takes an enormous amount of your time as a parent. And I was, I was spending like, six and seven hours a day doing homeschool stuff 
badly. And and then what so what had happened was I actually had this whole online system set up with um, with a whole an online education system that shall not that, be named. That shall not be named. That everyone who works there is an enemy of mine. <coughs> Google Classroom. And um, one day, they shut down my whole system. Like they locked me out of my account. I oh I'm like having PTSD just thinking about this. I oh I had all of these like worksheets and things that I had set up in the docs area like gone. To this day, I have no access to it. Shut down my homeschool. Because and, it wasn't a real school. That's what well, they, that was their view. Oh, well, that's, you're that's, siding with the with no, the bad no, people. No, no, I'm saying don't forget like, I, it how was annoying a real school that was. in my life. It was. A, in I my think it was mind. a real school. I, right, and they just the man said it wasn't a real school. Right, that's what I'm saying. And I handled it with grace and just and I said, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's okay, it's going to be okay. Is that how you remember? <laughs> no. <laughs> I lost my mind. I fell into a deep dark pit of despair. And then meanwhile, what, one of the things that had been going on is this is when I, I had started working at Sirius XM in talk radio and he was doing stuff with, he's a lawyer and just doing, Joe was doing legal stuff. And one of the things that started to come up is, is Joe said, I was raised by a single mother. How would, you know, let's say a, a parent who's a single parent and needs or wants to homeschool for some reason, how could they ever do the system as we have it, that it takes seven and eight hours a day of the parent's time. Am I, do I recall that yeah, correctly? Yeah, that was that, a yeah. big concern of mine because I, I really think homeschooling should be an option for everyone because there are certain circumstances where you just, you really need to. For kids being bullied or if you're just in a terrible school system or there are a lot of, there's just a lot of situations where it's, it's really not even optional. You just really need to homeschool, at least for a while. And it just, it can't take seven or eight hours a day. Yeah, and, the, and there's, and it, let me get one thing out there right now. And this is especially for the moms. I think dads are kind of, they don't care about this as much. But for the moms, one of the things that is out there in the ether of the homeschooling mommy world is this idea that if you say, uh, yeah, I don't want to spend seven hours a day on this. I, I don't because I have other interests and I have kind of other things I want to do with my life. That you're a bad mom and you're not checked into family life and definitely not checked into homeschool and you're just sort of generally a horrible human being. That feeling is out there. And this was very transformative to me when Joe said, no, that's a really normal thing to say I... I, I can't, I just can't spend seven, six, seven, eight hours a day on this because there are plenty of people, single moms, families where both parents have to work, just plenty of people can't. They don't have the time. And even if you're someone who technically could, like I, I wasn't working that much at that point, I could, but guess what? Here, moms, I'm going to give you permission here. It is okay to say, I just don't want to. I think I have some other things, I have gifts and talents that I would like to use, that I'd like to have some time to develop and contribute. And I don't want to spend eight hours a day on homeschool. So Joe kind of gave me permission to say, that's fine if you want to do that. So so that was, especially as someone who Can was- Can I tell you my two reactions to that? Oh yeah, um, to Because that, that vibe is out there. I think it comes from a very small number of people. Um, but my reactions are number one, I just disagree because disagree with what the idea that it should take seven or eight hours and you have to have you know all your kids you know you know reading latin to the cat and then you know like the mom <laughs> has to be like doing you know 10 different activities a day like <laughs> nature walks like like i'm all in favor of latin and i'm all in favor of classics and all of that and but, talking to cats and talking to cats i like cats but but the uh but you know just the just the root the routine of it and like we have to sit here for seven or eight hours I think it's actually counterproductive. I think the kids hate it. I think the moms probably hate it, or at least secretly. Uh, some of them claim to love it. Maybe they do. I don't know. Second thing, my second take is uh, about, uh, I'm quoting here from a famous golfer um, named Lee Trevino. You've probably yes, heard of Lee yeah, Trevino. Yes, my dad was a big golf fan. So, so yeah. Lee Trevino has this quote that he will never take a lesson from anyone that can't beat him. Oh, that's interesting. And that's kind of how I feel about some of the people that chirp a lot about education. like. You know, I feel pretty confident that I know how to do education. So um, I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, okay, but what would you say for the parent who's like, well, and this is where I was, I don't feel confident. I didn't go to Yale. You know, I, like, I, I do think it's important to get out there. Like, you don't, 
you don't have to, it, it is possible, and, and we'll go into the details here in a second, but it, it is possible if you need to homeschool or you want to homeschool to set up a system that doesn't take a ton of your time, but you don't, you don't have to be a chemistry expert. I, I guess what I'm saying is people might have heard what you just said there and think w what Joe is saying is that I have to have a, a very impressive education and in, in order to teach my kids. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you can go listen to uh, people who tell you you have to homeschool seven or eight hours a day, or you can listen to me, and I'm going to tell you you can do it. In, you know, the parent, parental time involvement is probably an hour or two, maybe three. Um, the kids probably do a little bit more than that, and you can decide who to listen to. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're saying you're like wh what? What we have really optimized on is the maximum impact for minimal parent involvement. Is that, or well, not minimal, but. Well, no, I, I, I mean, that's a goal, certainly. I mean, you wanna be efficient with all the resources you have, your children's time and energy, your time and energy, um, just the 24 hours in a day. I mean, there you have constraints, and, and including money constraints. I mean, another thing that I'm very cognizant of uh, when I've designed the system that we use is I don't use really expensive materials. You don't need to. There's so much that's out there for free or, or really cheap. So I would just say, you know, efficiency dictates that you, um, or the way the efficient, you know, method works out is that it doesn't end up taking more than, you know, one to three parental hours a day. So let's get into the nuts and bolts details of this system that you've developed when, again, my, when my homeschooling method fell apart and it was just, it was clear that we were at a breaking point and, and I just couldn't keep doing this six, seven, eight hours a day. What, where did you begin? I think maybe even going through chronologically of how our system developed might be easier for people to track with. So your wife yeah. is having a meltdown. She's screaming about a certain technology company and, the, and fixating on details. And you're like, wait, why don't I? <laughs> Let me give it a shot. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I did is I went through all of these huge curricula that you had bought, like just binders and binders of stuff. And I was just trying to imagine like, okay, I'm trying to teach the kids, you know, let's say multiplication. Why, how can I possibly need 10,000 pages to teach the multiplication? You know, it just doesn't seem like, so I looked through all these things and then I got a hand truck, which you call a dolly, and you'll never agree with term. me. No, it's a hand truck. It's a dolly. And I put them all on there and I took them to the trash. And... <laughs> <laughs> he did! I had these boxes of like the three-step method for blah, 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 blah. He just threw them in the trash. It was... It, those things were incredible, and they were so expensive too. Um, so, I spent so much money on them. So then I just started researching, you know, specific things. Like I want to teach these kids addition or multiplication or division, um, and I tried a lot of different things. But basically, what I ended up with is as as kind of the the first thing they do at each grade level is Brain Quest, and Brain Quest is kind of a survey. I wouldn't even call it a course, it's a workbook, and it goes through some social sciences, some math, some spelling, some grammar, you know, just a little bit of everything for that grade. It's kind of like that grade in simplified form in a box. Let me jump in to say that the, when you see the Brain Quest books, you like, I don't, it's one of the reasons I had hesitated to do this video is, I always felt like that was a secret that we we have our kids do these brain quest books and it is kind of a guide for the early elementary ed education because they're very what day class a like well, I mean they, it's they're, not they're, it's not complicated it's like they're really basic like, okay well they're they're drawn in this kind of cartoonish way okay but <laughs> That's not all we use. Well, first, the first thing you have to do is get your kids to read. And so the best thing we found for that is learning to read in 100 Easy Steps. That book, it's a classic and it's great. And um, I'm not saying BrainQuest is going to get you, you know, to college. I'm just saying it's, it's going to cover some of the basics. Then we also use, uh, I think it's by Harcourt and it's yellow covered and it's test prep and it's per grade level. And it has test prep. For what test? Just any for test? Great, for just like to second grade, like to test out a second oh, grade, okay. third grade, fourth grade, right? So there is, and I think it's broken up into like English language arts, math, and something else. But um, so for every grade level, those are the bare minimum, uh, the BrainQuest for that grade level and the, um, and the hardcore test prep 
for that grade level. And then they actually have to take the test and they have to score 80% or better to go to the next grade or else they just do it all over again. Meanwhile, there's tons of other learning happening, right? I mean, they're going to museums, they're doing online stuff, they are in sports, they're in religious ed, they're talking to us, they're talking to each other, they're playing video games. You'd be surprised um, how much desire to, re to want to learn to read video games like Minecraft can inspire in a kid. Oh, uh, um, I remember <laughs> our youngest, he was, uh, before he could spell, he figured out how to do this like text to type thing in Minecraft and he would click a little button and go, Long sword. <laughs> and then he right. could get the long sword and do whatever he was doing. But you know, but he was just dying to learn to read. That was when he was like three. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and let, let me, okay, let me pause you on this. Let me jump in with something to, to make sure that, that people are seeing this, because I think this is, the moms will especially be interested in this. When you homeschool, there, you will just have ups and downs in your life when you have more and less energy to give your kids an amazing education. And one of the great things about keeping, having a core system that is super simple is that if your family, let's say you have a crisis play out, you're sick, your husband's sick, there, there's just some crisis that lasts a couple of weeks and you can't do the museum trips and the nature walks and watch a great courses video with your kids or all, all this great extra stuff that you might normally be doing, you can always say, do 10 pages in Brain Quest today. And like, I don't even care which 10 pages, just do 10 pages in your Brain Quest book, look over this test review, like for if you're in fourth grade, like look over the test review. And, and I will say for any homeschooling system, this is probably the biggest mistake I made early in homeschool, is I developed a system that was inherently complicated. There was no simplified version of this system. It took hours of my time and a ton of energy every day. And, and these curricula that I was following were, they, they, they emphasized that too. It was like, you just have to do three hours on this to get through this day's lesson. And so when we would have something, one of the kids was sick, I was sick, Joe was sick, a family crisis would play out. There was no simplified version of the system for me to fall back on. And so we would just get behind and then I was doing nothing and I felt terrible about it and it took a while to catch up. So I want to emphasize whether you use our system or your own, you want to have a system that has a super simplified version and then a more robust, higher level that you can do most of the time, but you can fall back on the simple version during hard times. Right? Right. Okay. So, um, he felt like I went on too long. <laughs> well, you just, you stopped me right at a terrible oh, point. Oh, sorry. Because, sorry. you know, you may, where you stop me now, people are like, oh, all he does is brain quest and, and test prep. And like, I just really no. want to emphasize, we also, there are handwriting worksheets that we do that we have them read books. Um, even, even the, you know, new readers, there are a lot of books that are very, very simple. Um, the Bob books. Yeah. Well, actually Bob books are part, of, I, I'm glad you said that. That's really, to me, part, after you do the hundred lessons, Easy Lessons to Learn to Read, whatever that book's called. Then we do the Bob books. Those are basically just learning to read. But then there are a whole bunch of books that are like, I don't know what they're called, but like they're learning. Yeah, like, they're like stage they one, like, yeah, stage Yeah, they have one, two, two and three, three on the yeah. cover. And so, that, yeah. So, and then when they get a little bit older, we have them write book reports and we're doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of videos, Khan Academy, there's uh, Vsauce is really good on YouTube. Um, Although we didn't, we didn't so, use Khan Academy a lot, but, right? We did it sometimes, but let me let me just finish on this. So the um, the real goal is to go through these things as quickly as possible. So they're not we're not waiting. You know, we don't have our kids like finish first grade and then just sit there for a year because they it really doesn't take that long actually to do first grade stuff or second third. By the time they're in like third grade, they're usually doing like the fifth and sixth grade you know, brain quest and, and, you know, um, the hardcore test prep. So they, my goal is to have them learn what they need to learn as efficiently as possible. So for us, we, we go all the way through eighth grade and by the way, brain quest stops in sixth grade and then seventh and eighth grade, we use something called spectrum. We can talk about that later. Jen wants to go into details, but I, I'll link all this in the so notes. Le, so you let me know when you want to talk about high school, because that's how we do K through eight. Our system changes pretty fundamentally. We, we have a kind of a different philosophy about high school education, high school and beyond, than we do about K through eight. So K through eight is, we have a system when it comes to getting the basics, that's, that's very systematized. And then the additional things, the more things like um, the arts and things like that, 
we do make sure that our kids are getting that, but that's more almost the unschooling model of it's, there's not an art exam that you have to pass to make it out of fourth grade in our house. Um, so we so we kind of unschool for the softer subjects. What does that even look like? A fourth grade has what do you like? I don't, draw we have to like, yeah, like a mound of clay be like, and be like that is oh, a terrible okay. mound of clay, and so yeah. you fail. You're repeating fourth grade. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that was. So I mean, but, they, but do no, they do Play-Doh. They do Play-Doh. They do no, all kinds of arts jo and crafts. It's Joe, I have been in homeschooling mom forums that are seriously like we've got the big the the big art exam is coming up. I hope my kids are able to pass so they can make it out of kindergarten. I mean, you'd be amazed what I we moms do. I would not be amazed. Do. I think it's insane, but I to, would not be amazed. <laughs> yeah, but Joe has seen what we moms do to overcomplicate our lives. So systematize the basics and then, then kind of unschooling for the for the softer subjects. There's I disagree one, with that a little. I, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, 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 to me, it's like you can teach a four-year-old or an eight-year-old something about art history or or art generally, but for me, I'd rather just race through the reading, writing, and arithmetic and kind of get them generally able to, you know, learn and know what they need to learn. And then you can actually really teach them art history when they're 12 or 14 or 16. Then, you know, you can just, I, I just feel like it's, you're kind of wasting your time. I mean, maybe, I, I'm sure there are people that disagree with that, but I think trying to teach art history to a four-year-old uh, or even, I mean, eight-year-olds kind of on the line. They might be able to remember a little bit of, you know, this is Beethoven, this is Bach. They might even be able to play a little bit on the violin, but it's just, you know, I don't know. They That's can, what I said, isn't it? I don't know. I, don't well, think so. I, I, okay. I, forget well, what, I, I forget what you said, I, but I don't think so. Well, but but I'm I'm actually glad you mentioned that because I do I see I have seen so many moms they'll flip out that their their ancient Egyptology curricula that because they're using like five different sets of things to teach their kids about hieroglyphs and I'll be like well how you know how old is your kid and they're like oh he's six. Let's all let let's as adults think like do you remember that kind of like world history and things that you learned when you were in fourth grade? No, it's more like when you get into closer to adulthood, high school. Those are the ages where you can actually. I I, I actually let, let me interrupt myself to say, as you get into these older ages, I think that is when your brain is ready to start thinking about big picture things like what are the arts, what is world history where are we in world history my experience as a parent of six has been with all six of my kids it just seems like their brains are not designed to start thinking those big picture thoughts and absorbing those kind of things mm -hmm. until they're about junior high high school age would you would you I, agree? I, I agree with that now i'm fully in favor of taking kids to museums and kind of wetting their appetite a little bit you know just showing them like this is a great painting and here's why uh, we have a mug that, or a bunch of mugs actually, that have the Rosetta Stone on it because we saw that when we were in London and went to the British Museum. And so there are a lot of things you can do with your kids to, and I'm sending them links all the time, like, hey, this is a really cool painting and this is an analysis uh, from Sister Wendy. Remember Sister Wendy? Um, we, didn't, we didn't know her. I think she passed away not long ago, but she was a nun that did all this great art history stuff. So anyway, I'm always sending them that kind of stuff, but my goal really in the younger years is just to like get them interested you know, but sitting down and drilling them for three hours about, you know, you know, memorize these 20, you know, Spanish artists from the 14th century. Like, I don't think that's going to do any good. Right. At those ages. Yeah. So very different philosophy. Our philosophy switches pretty radically once you hit uh, eighth grade. So the kids hit ninth grade. You've heard what we've been doing up until that point. How do things change when they get into high school? Okay. So my view of high school is there are four maths, right, which are geometry, algebra two, pre-calc, trig, and calc, calculus. There are three sciences. I don't know why there's not a fourth, but there's biology, chemistry, physics. There are, you know, world. there's world history, there's American history, European history, whatever. There is similarly, um, you know, in, uh, American literature, British literature, world literature. So those are kind of the four main categories, right? History, math, science, and English, right? And this is for all of high school, yeah, right? Yeah, this is just that's just how I see high school. It's kind of this like four by four matrix. You uh, know? By the way, he's on a roll, and I need to grab a plug. And we're, we're having some technology issues. Keep talking, Joe. I'm going to grab a plug. I'll be right back. Okay. So the 
of course there are electives too. I'd love for my kids to do some economics in high school. I'd love for them to do some art um, and love for them to be doing some sports as well. But those to me are the main, you know, 12 or 16 or however many courses that they, those are the subjects they really, you know, need to learn. And I don't know what's going on over there, but it's not good. This is such a mess. <laughs> this office is not super organized. People are gonna think you plan this stuff. I mean, it's just, cra it's crazy, like. Okay. It's just crazy. Okay, so anyway. Um, okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> she's always like this. I mean, it's not, it's not an act. Um, so, but before we, in so, Basically what I try to do in high school is have the kids take one subject at a time. Let's say biology. That's very often one of the first ones they do. I don't care how they learn it. I'll give them a bunch of options. I love Great Courses Plus. Um, they can watch lectures. Uh, those are vi Great Courses videotapes some of the top professors in the world and presents their classes. Uh, and it's, it's a paid thing. It's like $180 for a year, but it's unlimited and multiple kids can use it. And I mean, it's all kinds of subjects. So they can watch the videos. That's usually what I suggest, but they can find other videos if they want. And I always have them start by looking at the test, you know, the biology. You know, I'll go find a, a test online. There's a, a thing called STAR, S-T-A-A-R, which stands for State of Texas Aptitude and Readiness or something like that. But those are kind of like the grade level high school tests. They're not too hard, but they're not too easy. So I'll have the kids go read the biology test. Just read it. They don't know what, they obviously can't get it anything right, but they have some idea of what they're studying towards. I'll give them a book. I'll give them a set of videos and I'll turn them loose. And I'll just say, you've got 30 days to get ready for this test. And when they get ready, and then when they take the test, if they don't get 80% or better, they have to start all over and retake it and restudy. And then I will maybe specify some things that they need to do. But long story short, they can use whatever they want. They just have to pass the test. And I, I have a test for every subject and that's high school. And, but before we start into high school, Let's talk about the GED. Before we get into that, one of the things I want to point out is that notice that this is a whole different way of thinking about education. And I think the reason that no one has yet done this, and it's frankly revolutionary, is it has only been within the past, not even decade, probably five years, that we had this kind of proliferation of information. I mean, there wasn't Khan Academy and Google. I mean, going back to my childhood, there was none of this. I mean, we had a library and that was it. And a lot of the books you might have needed for this sort of thing would have been checked out. So what this model, this Joe schooling model that he's developed does is this is a model that is brand new and reflects the fact that we have almost infinite access to information now. And the school system that everyone is using, whether it is traditional schools or whether it's homeschool, everyone is using these models that were developed before we had access to the internet and all of this information. So that's what I think is, is really revolutionary about this. I, I do think that all of the new learning tools are pretty revolutionary, but I think this system is essentially the one-room schoolhouse kind of system, you know, but you know, whatever. Well, that, well, it, okay, this system is one-room one room schoolhouse in the sense that you can teach multiple kids at different levels at once, but it is, what the, the slice that I'm taking on it is that Never before has there been a system where you can tell a kid, here's the chemistry test, do whatever you want to do to pass this test. If you are more of an audio-visual learner, right. watch a Great Courses video. Or if you're more a reader, read this book. The, in right. the one-room schoolhouse in the 1800s, you, couldn't, you just had to give the kid a specific book because there was only one book. Yeah. Now, the reality is 80, 90% of the time, the kids just, they just do whatever my suggestion is. So they rarely do they want to do the extra work of going out and finding some better, you know, materials. They just want to get through the materials and take the test and move on. So... Uh, uh, can I say one more thing before sure. we get to the GED? Yeah. I, I'm reading the mom's minds right now, and I know they're thinking, well, that's amazing that you can tell your kids to, like, go study for this chemistry test and do, you know, just figure it out. And they're thinking, I just don't know that my kids are that motivated. Like, it sounds like your kids are really motivated. And I do think our kids, are they have inherited, we're, we're both, as people can tell, kind of goal-driven, intense people. Our kids have inherited that. But um, 
what what would you suggest for someone who to, to just get their kids motivated to, to do this? Well, I, I don't know about motivation, but I will say I, I think I maybe gave the wrong impression there. Our kids have daily things that they're supposed to do. So if they're in the brain quest phase, uh, they should do 30 pages a day. And a lot, sometimes they only do 20. And if it's a hard math section, maybe they only do 10. Um, and I, and they may have questions, you know, um, so we have a babysitter that helps us a lot and, you know, she might be able to answer the question or sometimes I go to Jen, sometimes I go to me. If Jen's mom is over, she was a math major, they may ask her or they go to her house. I mean, they just kind of, or they maybe just go to YouTube videos and try to keep watching videos until they figure it out. But they do get stuck and, but they, but they do have daily goals, right? So once they get to the, let's say biology and high school level, the goal might be watch for, if they're going to do the, the great courses series, uh, video series, then I'll, I'll set a goal for them of, you know, four videos a day. Um, so they, they always have a daily goal. And what are, what, I mean, are there, people are wondering, okay, so are there consequences? I mean, what if a kid is like, yeah, I, I just, I didn't feel like it, I, I didn't do it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, that does happen sometimes too. And, uh, you know, we just, I don't know what we, we have conversations with them. We sit down with them. We say, look, you can't just do nothing. Right. Um, like, what are you doing all day? Like, can't play Minecraft. What are you going to be like a professional Minecraft player? I mean, you know, we just kind of, I don't know what you'd call that. I mean, just try to talk some sense into them basically. Well, I do. We did a previous video that you can look up about setting a vision for your family. The reason we started with that video is I have found as a person who has lived both ways with a, a very vision driven way and kind of a more just taking, reacting to life as it comes to you way, having a vision for your life and for your family makes everything so much easier because being goal oriented and vision driven is kind of the air that we breathe in our family. We, we don't even intentionally have set aside time to talk to the kids about it, but in any conversation we have with them, there's always this understanding that we're thinking about what do you want your future to look like over the long term and, and get excited about it. We're not telling you what to do. We're not saying that you have to be a doctor and you have to be a lawyer. What Whatever it is, maybe one kid wants to just be really into sports, fine, but just have a vision. And so we're constantly pushing our kids to be vision driven every day. It's again, it's not just like a once a week, once a month thing. And so because thinking long term, thinking about who they're meant to be, who God wants them to be, that sort of thing is just part of how they see the world and they think about their lives. I do think it makes motivation a little easier because if that kid just privately and personally is thinking, man, I love the idea of being a pediatrician. One of our kids would love to be a pediatrician. Like, oh, I just, I think about these kids. I could help. I could work with disadvantaged kids. Well, she just wants to get that chemistry homework done because she sees why it matters. And I think when kids are unmotivated, and I dealt with this a little bit when I was a kid, it's because they don't see why it matters. Convince someone why something matters and they will be motivated. Yeah, right? I agree with that. Uh, one, I, I do want to clarify that our kids can't just do whatever they, I mean, if they do need to like get an education that will allow them to make a living and then they can go play sports if they, you know, try to be a professional golfer or whatever. But first they need to get a degree in accounting or nursing or something that they can actually make a living with. So, um, I didn't do that, but <laughs> yeah, what did you major in? Well, I, well, I mean, I started out in, um, Journalism? mechanical, no, no, no. I started out in mechanical engineering, um, for two weeks. Yeah, and I was like that, but that's a lot of work. I liked it. I like math. I just it was a lot of work, and um, I ended up with a degree in advertising. And look, now I make no money doing YouTube videos. So right. kids, this is you can live this dream. You can have a stable job and quit it during a pandemic. You can do all this. Listen to me. <laughs> okay, so last thing I want to say uh, is about the GED. We use the GED as our ninth grade, just to make sure they've really got everything they need before they start delving into these high school level subjects. And the way we do that is we take the Barron's review. In general, I've, I've used all kinds of review courses for SATs, ACTs, AP exams, but I tend to find that Barron's is typically pretty good. And so I just get the Barron's GED review and I have the, it's about 500 pages and I have them work through it, 30 to 50 pages per day, which you'd be surprised. I mean, you can go through, if you do 50 pages a day, you can go through a 500 page book in 10 days. That's two weeks. So it doesn't really take that long. So um, they work their way through it. 
and they're little quizlets throughout and then they're they're checking their answers to figure out what they got wrong and figure out how to get it right next time and then they take a practice test and then they grade it and see what they got wrong and then they take the the real test there are two practice tests in the back of the baron's book so one of them we use as a practice test the other we use as like a final test again they have to get 80 percent to move on and so they usually do that around age 11 or 12. They usually do the GED thing. So they're usually starting high school subjects by about 12, 13. Um, and so my original goal was to have them do all the high school subjects by age you know, 16 and then take some AP exams because some of those things that they studied are AP exam. I mean, a lot take of them. Take it, what, like, so that they can place out of college, or would yeah, this just be, okay. both. I mean, you know, to, to make sure they really learned it and to place out of college. So, you know, it'd be nice if they had a calculus and a biology and a, you know, you know whatever, AP exam under their belt. And then we were thinking that they would just go to, like, the local community college for, you know, while they're 17, 18, and then, and then apply to college. So the idea was that they would, you know, show up at college when they're 18 with, you know, quite a bit of quite a bit of credit um, and quite a bit of experience, and they they would already know a lot of the subjects that they're going to encounter there. And we're very much on track to do that. And then our kids decided they wanted to socialize, yeah. so they go to the local Catholic school now when they when they hit high school. Yeah, and so we'll uh, we'll go into detail about that in a second. But what one of the things that uh, to be honest, I zoned out a little bit at the at the GED part. What? Why did they take the GED? I because the GED, I should know this because the G, GED stands for General Equivalency Diploma. So it's it's the test that you take if you didn't finish high school, but you want to show that you you know you basically have like a similar to a diploma, and so it's kind of you know a final check that they really do know all of the basics that they need to know to delve into more intense subjects. So even though that's typically taken at the end of a high school experience, you don't start them on high school until they take the GED. Right, because the GED is not like advanced high school. I mean, advanced high school courses are basically college courses. So yeah, that's just kind of how it works out. All right. So a, a couple of things that before we wrap up, th this, I think this is a good overview of what our system looks like. We can go into more detail later if people want. Give me your feedback, by the way. My website is thejfshow.com. You can find my email address there if you want more 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 discussion of any of these topics, we're happy to do so. But before we wrap this up, uh, two things that, that I want to follow up on that people will be curious about. You mentioned in passing that we have a babysitter. She is so much more, she's not just a babysitter. Like she is, she's a, a life manager. She's a house manager. That's true. And, and, that, and that is something that, you know, we've decided to make that part of our budget. We live in a small house like that. That was a trade-off we made. Speaking of, we have a whole video about trade-offs and vision. And one of the things we decided early on was support system is important. So we made some pretty big financial trade-offs to be able to have her. I, she she does a lot of house running things, including being kind of a study hall manager, kind of d doing some teaching, helping the kids learn to read. She's invaluable. She's amazing. Um, but I do want to make it clear, you can use this system without that. That is a huge aid to us to have her. But I don't want people to be like, I saw that Jen on Instagram has a nanny and like, so that's really the secret. That it helps, but you, what would you say to someone who's like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have anyone to help? I, you know, the one, you can do it without, you know, a, a babysitter for sure, or nanny or whatever, house manager, life manager. Yeah, you can do it yourself. That's true. But someone has to, you can't, I guess you could leave your kid alone all day, every day. I don't think you should or would want to, but in, there may be a stage of life where you have to for a little while. Um, but you kind of need to be keeping an eye on your kids anyway. And as long as you're in the same house, you could be working from home and they could ask you questions occasionally, right? In the morning, lunch, and after, you know, after you're done working. So there's a way to fit it in uh, to just to almost any schedule. I mean, I do think it might be a little tough, especially when they're younger, if they're 100% on their own. I don't know how that would go. Um, I, I would say, and we can go into this in more detail in another video, We another paradigm that I would like to see broken down in this culture is our perception that having a paid support system of, of household help is only for the rich. 
And I would really like to see moms break out of that mentality. There are ways, even if you are not rich, to make budgetary trade-offs to get some kind of help, even if it's not full-time. And especially if you have multiple kids, if you compare the cost of having a part-time, either babysitter, nanny, house manager, tutor, you know, whatever job description you want to give to that, if you compare the cost of a part-time person who can come in, make sure the kids are on track, help them you know, find where they are on their brain quest books or whatever, uh, you'll find that it's definitely cheaper than private school and it might make more sense than you think. So don't, as you hear us talking about this, don't immediately jump into saying, well, I'm not, I don't have hundred dollar bills to throw in the air so I couldn't have help. That, that's a limiting belief. And again, there's another video coming where I really go into my thoughts on that. So, um, and then the final thing is our oldest two do go to high school. So this, so the system that we've created, they just decided they wanted that high school experience. And that's another important thing to know about just our general life philosophy is again, we're, we're mission driven and we're, we're always connecting with our kids and talking to them. And so, you know, what we want out of life is to be close to our kids and to have kid, our kids fulfill their God-given mission of, of what they're meant to do uh, in the world. And so if homeschooling facilitates that, which it did for many years, then that's what we do. Whereas if going to public school or private school or whatever, part-time school, if that facilitates that, then that's what we do. And, and I really, really encourage people, don't make your school choice your religion. It, we, we're all lucky that we have all of these choices and options. And, and I even see people do that in the school system. They get so bought into the school system that they might not recognize this is not working anymore so, and my kids might benefit from homeschool and vice versa, right? So be ready to switch right. from charter school to public school yeah. to private school to homeschool, whatever is working for each for that kid that year. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I do want to say that on the front page, I think it was of the New York Times maybe a few days ago, it's August 2020 as we're making this, um, there was an article about educational home homeschooling pods, I think they called them. There's kind of a movement where a lot more people are homeschooling now because of the quarantine and everything, coronavirus, that, and people are just sort of naturally pooling together with other families <clears throat> to split um, costs of that babysitter, hall monitor, proctor, study hall guide, whatever you want to call that person, or maybe they take turns doing it. And uh, it also fulfills some of the socializing that kids just naturally want and need. Um, so that's, that's something else to consider. And um, I was going to say one other thing, but... Well, let me do it. You can jump in if you okay. think. Can right. I jump in with yeah. one thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, and then uh, one thing I want to follow up on with the idea of doing what works for that kid for that semester. One thing I did feel when I was running homeschool poorly is sometimes when I got frustrated, I would say offhanded things like, well, if you're going to bring that kind of attitude, then maybe you just need to go to school. That was not helpful. And that's a threat. Well, really. it's a threat. Yeah. It, there's a lot that's wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But the, the point is that there is, um, you, we have so many great education options now, you can really start to feel decision fatigue. And your kids can start to feel that if every day it's up in the air as to, are we going to continue homeschooling tomorrow? Or maybe next week I'll go to school. Maybe, you know, what happens is when they hit a block in their education and they're frustrated by a subject, they can start thinking, you know what, maybe I don't want to deal with this chemistry workbook right. and I, I'm just, I'm going to jump ship. I'm going to go to school. Everything will be easy over there. So I do think make your decision for the semester, maybe even for the whole academic year and say it, it does not matter how, how much we like this or don't like this short of a true emergency. We are, we're sticking with this until the end of the semester or of the year. There will be no rethinking this. There will be no, you know, it, we're finishing our current school model until the end. And then that, that prevents your kids from wanting to shift education models just because they're, they're struggling with one subject. I remembered the other thing I was going to say. Um, I was always n wondering, you know, as I was doing all this Joe schooling for all these years for all these kids, what's going to happen when they actually enter a school, whether it's community college, college, high school. And so we have the answer now. We have two kids in high school 
and they've done very well. And I feel like that's kind of uh, the the final proof that um, oh, that, it, that it really works because um, they're they're certainly you know ready for school now. Transitioning from homeschool to school always is going to be a little bumpy because whereas before they could really focus on one subject for like a month until they're done with it and they can take the test as many times as they need to, it's a much less forgiving environment in school. In school, you got to write down everything you know, on a to-do list and get it turned in on time or you, your grade gets docked. Um, so they, but that's a life skill and they, they've had to adjust to that and that was a little bumpy. You know, in, at certain times, uh, taking notes, um, you know, just keeping track of all the pieces of paper, things like that. Um, but in terms of just, you know, were they academically ready? Yeah, and they've done well. So. Yeah, and, and I would say uh, for anyone who is shifting academic models, this is so important. Might even, this, this is in the top three most important things we're going to say on this video. Anytime you shift an academic model, the first semester is going to be bumpy. And it was that I think it's important that we're honest about that. It it was bumpy when when our kid went from always having been homeschooled into a, a really great school that he's going to now. That first semester was rough, and some of that was was his unique temperament and, and things like that. But it, it was a rough semester, but it worked out. We stuck with it. He's doing great now. Every everything's great now, and you will find that too if you're switching from a traditional school system to homeschool. Don't despair if you're a couple of months into that semester and you're having trouble keeping up with things, you don't feel like you're in a rhythm, the kid's motivation waxes and wanes. It's normal. Give it six months to evaluate before you decide if this is working or not because transitions are always bumpy. Sounds good. All right, well, we will continue this series. You can connect with me on Instagram. Jennifer Fulweiler is my handle over there. Joe is also on Instagram, Joe Fulweiler. He, I, like I said, he'll do like the picture dump. Get ready for like 60 pictures when we've gone out and done something. You can follow us both there. If you would like to send me an email with any requests, topics, uh, I'd love to hear from you, thejfshow.com, or leave a comment. We will be looking at comments, trying to answer questions that people leave there. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future videos on this subject.